Want to know why? Ask how. <laughs> Howard the humongous. Okay, here's the deal. I want to show you how to take 20 years off your life. I want to show you how to be stronger than Mother Nature ever expected you would be. Um, I want to show you how to, in the words of the poet Andrew Marvel, how to roll all of your strength and all of your sweetness into one ball and roll it with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our stand, sun stand still, yet we will make him run. And the lesson begins with Bob Marley. You know that uh, my fascination after the age of 13, at the age of 10, it was, uh, it was cosmology and microbiology. At the age of 13, it became mass human emotions, mass human behavior, the forces of history, how an Adolf Hitler manages to put together a torchlight parade that gets people a sense of exaltation, of being a part of a process so much bigger than themselves that it gives their life a whole new meaning and carries them forward into attempting to change the very face of civilization and mankind, unfortunately, in a diabolical and evil way. Nonetheless, Adolf Hitler was a master at working the forces of history. He was a true artist. And the real question is, for you at the age of 13, how in the world do you come to understand using the tools of microbiology, of um, cosmology and theoretical physics, the underlying tools of science, how do you come to understand these mass forces of history? So at the age of God knows what, in 1968, the age of 25, when you graduate from college with four graduate school fellowships and their fellowships in neurobiology and clinical psychology, you turn down all of them because you realize that none of them are going to carry you anywhere near the kind of mass, overwhelming eruptions of passion that cha make and change the forces of history. So you end up eventually on the track of these forces, founding the biggest PR firm in the history of the music business and working with Prince, Michael Jackson, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss Queen, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, etc. You know that story already. You don't need to hear it again. But at one point in the early 1980s, I was hired by Chris Blackwell, the mastermind who put reggae on the map, to work with his best friend, Bob Marley, the person with whom he had planted reggae on the map. And the task, as Chris, Chris presented it, went something like this. Bob Marley could sell out soccer stadiums in any country in the world he chose. Italy, Switzerland, Sweden, um, in Africa, in South America. But when it came to the United States, the best Bob Marley could do was sell 20,000 tickets, 30,000 tickets. A soccer stadium holds 120,000 people. 20,000 or 30,000 people would look like an empty soccer stadium. How could we build an audience for Bob Marley? The trick was that Bob Marley was from the islands. Um, white American blacks, African Americans, as they call themselves in the United States, do not regard um, people from the islands as coming from the same tribe. So my task was to cross Bob Marley over to U.S. North American Americans in a big way. I was working at that task very diligently when we got some really horrifying news. Bob Marley had cancer and his prognosis was death, period, death. And my job changed immediately. My job was no longer bringing Bob Marley to a larger audience in the United States. It was keeping Bob Marley alive. Keeping Bob Marley alive? He's under a death sentence. What in the world do you mean keeping Bob Marley alive? It goes like this. Every single organism on the face of this planet is under a death sentence. Someday it will die. You will die. I will die. The plants in your house will die. The trees in the forest will die. It's only a matter of time. How in the world do you cheat death? How do you take all of your sweetness and roll it up with one, uh, into one ball and roll it with, rough, with pleasures and rough strife through the iron gates of life? 
You take advantage of every microsecond, every second, every minute, and every hour and day that you've got. You make them rich as hell. You make them so rich that they defy death, that they defeat death, that they utterly trump death. So my challenge became to make sure that when Bob Marley woke up in the morning, he perceived every day as living. And he perceived it as living in the richest way possible. What did that mean? Bob Marley was staying at a chalet in Switzerland so he could be near an alternative doctor that he had confidence in. Bob never traveled alone. He traveled with an entourage that was like a small tribe. It was 25 people. And Bob got up in the chalet every morning in his room, probably on the second floor, went down to breakfast um, and had all of the newspa newspapers from all over the world spread out around his plate in front of him. And if a single newspaper said that Bob Marley was dying of cancer, Bob Marley began to die of cancer. He left the breakfast table. He went straight up to his bedroom. He never turned on the lights. He stayed there all day long in a state of depression, dying. On the other hand, if Bob Marley got up in the morning, went downstairs, started to eat his breakfast, and saw that no paper anywhere in front of him said that Bob Marley was dying of cancer, Bob Marley was vigorous, Bob Marley went out on the front lawn with his crew, and they played soccer, and they had a wonderful time in the sunshine. So my job as Bob Marley's publicist was to make sure that no paper anywhere in the Western world or any part of the world ever said that Bob Marley was dying of cancer. What's the lesson in that for you and me? Let me tell you another story. I'm 70 years old. Less than five years ago, when I was approximately 65 years old, the age of retirement, um, I started dating a new girlfriend. And I noticed looking in the mirror, I didn't like the way my chest looked. To me, it looked like it was not old yet, but it looked like it could easily get old. So I started to do push-ups. And the first day that I started to do push-ups, I only was able to do 19. And then eventually, approximately a year ago, after four years of working at this, um, I was able to get to 180. And then all of a sudden, I was able to get to 200 and to 300 and to 350 just by doing push-ups every single morning, five days a week. And then finally, a Facebook friend who was an expert trainer said, you're about to reach 400. I knew he was dead wrong. That had to be ridiculous. How could you possibly ever reach 400? And sure enough, two months later, I reached 400. Yesterday, I did 430 push-ups. I'm 70 years old. And here's the remarkable thing that doing those push-ups does for me. Every day when you wake up and you're 70 years old, you believe that you are aging. And because you are aging, society tells you you're aging. Because you're aging, you're always aware, uh, you're always capable of being aware first thing in the morning of five or ten new pains that you hadn't noticed before. Another five or ten old pains that you had noticed before. And if your brain says you're aging, you collect those and you keep track of them for the rest of the day. If you're in a situation analogous to Bob Marley's situation, you don't perceive yourself as living, you perceive yourself as dying. If you do push-ups, if you do 20 push-ups, if you do only 30 push-ups, very first thing in the morning before you do anything else, your body delivers a message to you. It says, you're not getting old, you're capable of doing 20 push-ups. You're not getting old, you're capable of doing 80 push-ups. You're not getting old, you're capable of doing 200 push-ups, 300 push-ups, 400 push-ups, which is what it becomes if you stick to it diligently. In other words, you set up a new perceptual framework for the day, and instead of collecting stories of aches and pains and filling them into a picture that says that you are deteriorating, you collect stories of your triumphs because your push-ups have told you you are alive, you are living, you are growing into new possibilities and new things. Try it. It's a perceptual astonishment. You do the equivalent of what I was required to do for Bob Marley. Save his fucking life every single day by giving him the sense, the perceptual frame that said, you are living. Even if you only have two hours of life, you have two hours in which to live vigorously and cheat death. When I was 20 years old, 
I was hanging around with a group of friends and one of them, a group of acquaintances, I didn't have much in the way of friends, but it was a group of acquaintances and one of them was about to turn 25 years old and he was agonizing. He was agonizing because he was about to be so old. So you can perceive yourself as old and withering at any age you want, but you can perceive yourself as young and growing at any age you want, even the age of 70. It's all a matter of how you set up your perceptual frame. I recommend push-ups first thing in the morning before you put on any clothes, before you do anything else. You will rapidly discover if you stick to it for six months that you are cheating death every single day of your life, that you are rolling all of your sweetness and all of your strength up into one bowl and tearing your pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. This is Howard the Among Us speaking to you from the future. It's your job and my job to make or wonder why ask how Howard the Among Us How for the off button. There we go. Utter incompetence and I found it, I think